As a trauma survivor, I have always been interested in resilience. But growing up, I believed it was something that you were born with. Then in graduate school, I learned that it was a quality that we all possess and a set of skills we can all strengthen. Most of my resilience has come from writing and seeing myself in new ways by confronting the stories I've always told myself. The more I did that, the stronger I became, and I've dedicated my life to helping others do this work. This podcast is for anyone who wants to understand their story and how to revise it, because when we do that work, we change the world. Is there an age when it's too late to publish a book, forgive a person, or take a chance on yourself? Not if you're Mildred Kirstenbaum. With the help of her daughter, Gail, Mildred is a 101-year-old Instagram sensation and debut author who's currently on a book tour. Join us as we discuss the challenges of mother-daughter relationships, how forgiveness turned Gail and Mildred into best friends, and the secrets to lifelong learning and living vibrantly, no matter your age, plus so much more on this week's episode of the Writing and Resilience podcast. Let's dive in. Well, hello, Gail and Mildred. Welcome to the Writing and Resilience podcast. I am so excited to have you on today. Thank you. And, Thank and you. we're both excited. Well, I'm thrilled for you because, Gail, we met, I think it was 2019, and you were working on a memoir. And then all kinds of things have happened. The pandemic, you've switched your Instagram, and now, Mildred, you are an influencer. And all of this has led to this book. Mildred's mm-hmm. Mindset, which is a coffee table book that you two have self-published. We're going to talk about that process in a few minutes, but so much has happened and your lives have just cracked open. What would you like us to know about the two of you and your book? Nothing much. <laughs> I'm 101 and I live my life to the fullest. I realize you walk through this once. You don't get a second chance. I have a good attitude. I treat people the way I would want to be treated. If I'm in a restaurant and the waitress does something wrong, she's not working as a waitress because she loves to be a waitress. She's working there because she needs the money. Yeah. So have a good attitude. Be sympathetic. Understand that she needs the money. She's not doing a job she loves. The big thing is I try to treat people the way I want to be treated. I love that about you, Mildred. Gail, what would you like us to know about you? Well, I'm a creative. I came out of the womb super sensitive, super intuitive, and as a creative. I will say, I don't know if people believe this or not. I think I came into this world as an old soul, Mm. a family of new souls. So even though I was the youngest of three children and obviously the youngest in the family, I feel like I came into this world with knowledge, which I didn't see in my family. Mm -hmm. And it helped me through many things I experienced in my childhood and life. And I don't know, should I mention anything about the journey here? Yeah, go right ahead. Okay. So we didn't get off to a good start. (laughs) I would say probably at birth. She might disagree because she told everybody she's giving birth to Gary. And I had two boys and I took a (laughs) saliva test. And the saliva test said I'm going to have another boy. It's 50% correct. Look how stupid I was when I was young. (laughs) And so I prepared a name for a boy. She took it the other way, that I wanted a boy, not a girl. That's stupid, plain stupid. (laughs) Plans to, when you have two boys, you want a girl. When you have two girls, you want a boy. Not always, but we won't go there. Beauty is in the eyes of the beholden, but she (laughs) read it the wrong way. So I will stand up for that. Yes, I was a little difficult with her because Gail had selective hearing from this height. When I called her, she chose to hear me, she answered. If not, she didn't. And that was Gail. She always danced to her own tune. Can I go now? Go ahead. (laughs) So first of all- And remember, I'm wearing my boxing gloves. (laughs) I I might not be good in math. She just announced that Gail was born into a numbers family and she's not a numbers person, but I do know what 50% says. 
So you embrace Yay. you embrace the boy part, not the girl part. And there are certain personality traits, women on the narcissistic level who don't do well with same sex children mm. uh, because there's a competition. And, and as you know, I'm sure you know, and many of your listeners, the most highly charged relationship is the mother daughter relationship. Mm -hmm. and if you go and just Google on Amazon family relations and you put any kind of mother daughter, mother son, father son, the one that has the most books is the mother daughter. And yeah. the category is daughters and narcissistic mothers. It was tough. So when I hit middle age and I was living in Los Angeles making TV and I was having all this career success, I was mm -hmm. lucky. I had beginner's luck. Uh, you won an Emmy? For the first film, I say your skills are transferable because I never went to film school. And suddenly I'm all over the media and the Today Show in New York, whatever. And then I'd go home to visit and it would be the criticisms, the bullying, and not just from my mom, but my brothers, because they were raised that way. Mm -hmm. And they continued on through adult life. And one brother became a doctor, one became a lawyer. It doesn't matter your profession or your wealth, right? Abuse and this kind of behavior can happen in any society, any economic society, anywhere. So long and short of it is I dreaded going home to visit. And when the criticisms kicked in and being a super sensitive person, I would either, you know, cringe or give it right back. It was exhausting. And I went back to LA. I had another life. I was really middle age when I realized that I couldn't keep going like this, mm -hmm. that I would have to go on a journey. And I realized I would have to figure out how to forgive her. So, but before I did that, I said to her, when because she always wanted to get me to a plastic surgeon's office, I said, okay, mom, I will agree to go to three plastic surgeons as long as I can have a camera crew along with me. And she didn't care. She was thrilled. And I said, I'm going in for consultations. So I had a crew with me. We went to three different doctors. And what resulted in the end was a very funny short movie called My Nose. And mm -hmm. I would say that changed everything because as a short film, it played with other films and film festivals. So mm -hmm. when I invited to be on the stage, I would be with the other filmmakers, right? Doing like a Q and A. But when we were done and getting off the stage, the line was always in front of me. And it got to the point I knew what everybody was going to say. They said, I love your nose, don't touch it. I can't stand your mother. How do you even talk to her? And I'm thinking, well, you've, this is a light fluffy movie. And three is let me tell you my story. Mm -hmm. And at least I didn't have to be at a, a nose. One woman opened up. I remember she seemed so old to me. She was probably 65. I'm older than her now. Opened up her coat to show me her weight issues and attributed it to her long deceased mother. And that's when I realized, oh my God, there are so many people suffering from childhood trauma. And that's when I went and I developed my course and my steps. But the first line into that article was, if you have a mother like Gail Kirschenbaum, you better get yourself into psychoanalysis. Mm. So my mom read it and said, that's great. Um, bad press is better than no press. I'm on the cover of the Washington Post. That is beauty is in the eyes of the <laughs> beholder. That is true. And I think to me, one of the things that is so remarkable about your story is that, Gail, you went on this forgiveness journey. You wrote a beautiful movie and you went through this whole process in the movie about how to forgive. And the two of you don't always see eye to eye. We see that even now. Oh. And yet, <laughs> you know, some people would think reconciliation would be impossible. You can't have a good relationship when things are like this. And yet the two of you have this beautiful relationship and that breaks the mold around what's possible. So what do you think is the most important thing that happened that just cracked it open that allowed the two of you to be the best friends that you are, even when you don't always see things the same way? Don't sweat the small stuff. Gail and I reached a point and you know our relationship, she'll jump right in and down my throat if I'm wrong. <laughs> I would rather go on vacation with Gail than anyone else. Hmm. I would rather go to happy hour with Gail than anyone else because we live our own lives when we go. Mm -hmm. We go to happy hour. 
and hypothetically you're sitting on my left and I'm talking to you, she's not going to get offended. Either she'll jump in or talk to the person on the right. Mm -hmm. I go with people I know who are Gail's age. I have to be on tippy toes because they'll get insulted that I'm talking to someone <laughs> and they're not. We are free. Well, we do exactly what we want and we enjoy each other's company. Not all the time. <laughs> Many times I hang up on her. Mid-sentence. Now that's a new thing. She hangs up mid-sentence. So to answer your question for me, it was the movie that I made when, after the nose film, I'm going to answer that question. I said to her, will you go work? Uh, will you work on our relationship in front of the mm -hmm. camera? And that ended up being the feature doc called look at us now, mother. Mm -hmm. And the turning point, the key for me on my journey to finding forgiveness was reframing how I looked at my mother. Mm. So I went from looking at her because what gets us so upset in life is unfulfilled expectations. Mm -hmm. when, and so with, with every title, every, every role a person has in your life, friend, spouse, mother, son, dot, whatever, mm -hmm. those are the list of expectations, what you're yeah. supposed to be like, right? So mother, well, obviously you should love, you should nurture me, you should support me, you should be there for me. And when I saw her doing that with my brothers and quite the opposite for me, it was really bad. Mm -hmm. So when I changed how I looked at my mother and I looked at her as a wounded child, it flipped, but how did I get there? How was I able to look at her as a wounded child? I had to dig into her past. I did my research, found the tragedies and the hardships of her childhood. Mm -hmm. and that made me flip the switch for me. So when the criticisms continued on, and I now saw as a wounded child, they bounced off of me. Mm -hmm. You know, I say to people when I get up and speak or teach, I say, you know, I never had children, so I can't say firsthand, but I, anyone who has children, I say, if your little kid looked up at you and said, mommy or daddy, I don't love you anymore. What are you going to do? You're not going to smack them. That means they want love. You lift them up, you give them love. So when your mother says you're fat, you're stupid, you're going to amount to nothing. They need love because, you know, hurt people hurt people. But mm -hmm. when you feel the love, we give love to other people. So we only have control over ourselves. We only have control over mm -hmm. our own thoughts, right? We can't control anybody else. But what happens is by changing how we react to somebody. So when those criticisms come through, right, where most of us usually cringe, run, give it right back, mm -hmm. if you let it bounce off because you look at them as a little wounded child, they eventually stop sending those criticisms because they're not mm -hmm. the impact they're trying to get. So you're actually taking the power away from somebody who's saying things that are hurtful to you. And that was the beginning of transforming our relationship and, and where we are today, you know, and a big turning point in our life also was when my father died in 2006, mm -hmm. just didn't work on that relationship yet. And I was with her here in Florida. She had never been alone. She went from her parents. To, she married as a teenager to my father. Big traveler. She opened up a travel agency due mm -hmm. to the benefits. This is pre-internet. And I was here when I got an invite to Avignon Film Festival. And she said, I'm coming with you. I said, you are. And I thought, how do I say no? She was alone. And I knew she had no one to travel with now. And the whole family thought we'd come home not speaking to each other. And it was the beginning of a turning point because she came into my life. She saw, mm -hmm. we fought all the time. And she was like, I'm not staying at, she never stayed at b and so always, mm -hmm. you know, the American hotels. And I found this great B&B, a paper mill that was converted. They don't have air conditioning. And, you know, till I got there, I had to stop at every town looking for air conditioning for her. So, yeah. So here we are, you know, who would have thought? <laughs> People who knew me then, who witnessed then, my childhood cannot believe today. Yeah. And so what I hear in this gal is number one, you reframed the experience and you reframed the relationship. And also you found a way to tap into your sense of self and your own power. And that helped you be able to see this differently. I have a question for you, Mildred, and this isn't on the list. So I don't know is always a great response. 
my grandma was someone that I was very connected with. She helped raise me when I was a child. She did not live life to the fullest. She had a lot of limitations, a lot of issues with depression, and even had a suicide attempt when she was younger. And so when I was reading your story and about how your father had attempted suicide, that was something I connected with because that was a part of my family experience. And one of the things that both she and my grandfather were like this, they would not say, I love you to us. And I know some of that was generational because I love you meant something else when you grew up. She was raised during the depression and those words meant something else. They were more romantic words. And so I know that was a piece of it, but something happened inside her when she turned 90, she suddenly saw the world in a different way. It was like she woke up and or had some sort of awakening. And it was, a, I think, a month after she turned 90, she said, Lisa, I love you. I want to tear up for a second. It was like this big moment. And so what I'm curious about for you, Mildred, is as you got past 90 and now you're past 100, you're 101, how has the way you see the world and how you feel about people changed now that you're this age? I guess I have more patience with people. I have a book presentation and there's a neighbor who was dismissive about it, but yet I know she cares because she calls to find out how I feel. She knows I felt, could I get you something? Mm -hmm. Could I do something? So I take, I take it in segments. Mm -hmm. Well, I, was, I, I think something that's really important that I would like you to share. So she never acknowledged she hurt me or did anything wrong, but at 99, so now she's, you know, kicking into social mm -hmm. media. And right. I, I'm the one really put pulling this whole thing together. And I said, okay, mom, we need, it's that uh, we're Jewish. We need a video for young Kipper. And in the Jewish faith, that's the day of atonement. And she was stalling. And I said, well, mom, why don't you do a video about us, our story? So tell them what you did. Do you remember? Yes. So I did a video asking Gail to forgive me for all my transgressions against her. Mm -hmm. And? And it went but, viral. Okay, <laughs> so the, what? And the author yeah. like, well, well, I just want to say what else was on the video. So first she said that she was very harsh to me. And that for that, she asked my forgiveness, but she says, I know in my heart, she forgave me. I mean, I teach forgiveness. I forgave her years before. Mm -hmm. And then she goes, you said, but now I have to forgive myself. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I remember watching that. And so for people who are listening and they don't know the whole story in terms of your Instagram. So Mildred is on Gail's Instagram. And I think we're going to link to that specific uh, video because I think it was such a powerful one. I remember watching it. And then that's what made me think of my grandmother and that thinking about the world in a different way. And one of the things that you do in this book is share some of the wisdom that you have gathered as you've turned not just 100, but now 101. And you guys have a book launch. I mean, Mildred, you're everywhere. <laughs> I'm never at a loss for words. I always said to get, I was a public speaker for cerebral palsy and things like that and active in a local synagogue. I said, all I need is an opening line from there on. And I do not need notes. And, <laughs> and that's okay. life. An opening line in life. Yeah. Live it to the fullest. There's no return. Yesterday is gone. Today is here. You don't know what tomorrow brings. Enjoy every day. There was a 65-year-old woman that we came across. It was our first book launch. It was, mm -hmm. I launched the book on March 8th, which is International Women's Day in New York. And there's a literary salon and in, in, Brooklyn. A, in a gorgeous brownstone, private. You had to pay to go. And cocktails and classical live classical music. We're in the taxi on the way over there. It was pouring. And mom mm -hmm. says, I don't even know where we're going. No one's going to be Nobody's here. Gonna show up. And it was coming down. Like you have to be crazy to show up. Mm. And we walked into a full house. And now yes. you, this is where we were when a woman, so we were doing the book 
you know, Q&A and talk. And a 65-year-old woman said to you what? She's been on, she's traveled, she had enough already. She's not going to do anything more. So I gave her a what for? And nice. after I got through with her, she was booking a trip. She says, now Wonderful. again. Now she has, a, she inspires a lot of people. Yes. And I feel inspired by you. And I'm so glad that you talked to that woman because I'm thinking about how old you are. And this is a math question or a math problem. I think, you know, if you were 65 and you made that decision, you would have lived 36 more years. That is a long time. Doing nothing. Yeah. To do nothing. And so nothing. you would, and you're doing all kinds of things, including this book. And I remember, Gail, when you and I talked on the phone and you said, this book is coming out. Time is of the essence. My mom's turning, I think, 100 at that point, And I got to get it out there, right? It's going to happen. And so, you know, a lot of authors think there's just one way or that if you self-publish, you can't be successful. You know, you're going to have these limitations put on you because of the way you did this. As you just said, you had a full house for your book launch in New York City. I saw the videos. It was amazing. You've been on all of these news programs. I will link to the most recent one that you just sent to me in the show notes. And you are successful. People wanted this book because you have this Instagram. And how many followers do you have at this point? I think 115,000. Yeah, 115,000 followers. So how did you have the courage to, to say, you know what, we're self-publishing and not only are we going to self-publish and just get the book out there so I have it in my hands, we're going to be successful. Okay, so- That I attribute to Gail. <laughs> Oddly enough, I had uh, a publisher for my memoir that was supposed to mm -hmm. come out this Mother's Day. And what happened was the fans on Instagram. So just to give background, I, I launched mm -hmm. my Instagram originally for my fine art photography, which I was started to do between movies. And it was growing slowly because if you remember when Instagram started, it was the visual format yes. and Twitter was the words. Mm -hmm. uh, and then what's TikTok took over, Instagram was like, we got to do videos on Instagram. Yes. So long story short, it was growing at a slow pace. And then we were on this cruise when my mom turned 99. We had just lost my elder brother. So my mom and my surviving brother and I went away to mm -hmm. be together. And I aimed my phone at her. We were having breakfast. And I said, so mom, what is it like to turn 99? And she said, I can't believe I have all my marbles. Whatever she said, I put on my feet and it went viral. And that's when I realized my mother has something that everybody else wants. So yeah. I decided to dedicate the feet to her, us, and blah, blah, blah. And it took off. Okay, so why the book? All of a sudden, the fans are going because they love her tips, right? She mm -hmm. does it. I'll be on the phone with her and she'll tell me something happened. I said, Ma, you have to make that video. So... I live in New York. She lives in Florida. I do spend a lot of time with her. But when I'm not here, the show has to go on. We right. need content. So she's very tech savvy, everyone. She has an iPhone, iPad, and a Dell computer. So I taught her how to use the phone, how to focus it to video herself. And then she sends it to me and I do the editing and put mm -hmm. it up. So, okay. So, so these videos were getting lots of hits and plays, some going into the millions and, you know, the one on attitude ended up, I think Maria Shriver put her on a feed, mm -hmm. then she wrote it better. And then that ended up on Jen and Hoda. And just like one thing takes And off. then I was on with them. So all of a sudden they're all going, Mildred needs a book. Mildred needs a book. So, you know, on Instagram, you could poll. Mm -hmm. So I poll self-publish or traditional came back, self-published, you don't have time. And they said, we'll help you financially. And I I never did a GoFundMe. I always did Kickstarters for my films, but that's so complicated. And mm -hmm. I just didn't have it in me to do it. You have to gift and whatever. Yeah. Put up a GoFundMe and it got funded. And so I kicked in very quickly. Essentially how the book came together is I sat down with my mother and asked her, you know, let's get, X number, I think I have 20 tips in there. And I sort of took the notes and used her verbiage, how she did it. I realized I needed to do a little intro about her life. She's very funny. She's the queen of the one-liners. Mm -hmm. Like 
one day when people asked her at my screening of my movie, of the movie we did together, Look at Us Now, Mother, and we had a big party afterwards and they're going, so Mildred, what's your next movie? She goes, porn. You know, one of the journalists called her geriatric shock jock. Mm -hmm. So I took Rosa narrative where I got a lot of these funny one-liners in mm -hmm. and her tips. And then I see when I put up videos that have archival pictures, they just love it. People are like, oh, it's so fast, mm -hmm. it's so fast, you know? So I went through, she has a huge archive and every spread was a decade of her life. She wrote the annotations. They said, mom, let's sit and you, oh, my polka dot dress. I remember that. So mm -hmm. she wrote, the, they're personal and funny. And, and then I found someone who self-published many books who worked with me and he designed it. And I put in some of my drawings and it was done in no time. And the great thing about this is I put up a website. So you have to get all your marketing material ready. Okay. Yeah. So before you put it out, like I put out in 2001, when it was really banks and big corporations having websites, mm -hmm. I was working on a movie with my dog. I had a camera built for it. It was also years before GoPro existed. I ended up learning Dreamweaver a little bit, Photoshop mm -hmm. a little bit, but I came up with a very creative website and very visual, found someone to do Flash. These are the days of Flash for animation. I wanted it. So there's another thing that people could hear. This is way before social media. Mm -hmm. I wanted to get people engaged. This is years before blogging. My dog and I will write a diary every day. We have an entry. Mm -hmm. And then I said, okay, I'm going to do a newsletter. So you always think engagement. I got a dog psychic so people can send in their questions. And we did a photo contest that my dog judged. So <laughs> I ended up landing a front cover two page feature in the New York times because of my website mm -hmm. and because I found a writer who was writing about animals. So I love this frame with the cat. That's a great yes. So back to this book. So I just used all those sort of skills. I knew we were mm -hmm. going to put it out. So we put it out immediately in hard, soft, and Kindle. And then, because they love her Brooklyn accent, I wanted to do an audible. And so since the book also has a lot of pictures, when you buy the Audible, you get the PDF download, which nice. has the gallery. And I have to tell you, having not had a very good experience with a literary agent on mm -hmm. a book and letting that relationship end, this was such a free experience because mm -hmm. I'm not sitting there waiting. Did you send it out? How come I'm not getting emails back? Mm -hmm. What is going on? You know, I'm sitting there waiting and I'm watching one week, one month, yeah. two months, three months pass. I know I'm not top of mind. I know, you know, she's got other clients. When you have control, oh my God, it's just great because you know, you can make it happen. So here, I knew my mother was great content. I knew that people loved her. I saw it. So that's sort of the test when you're putting up mm -hmm. videos. And then I think we're going to launch actually a Instagram live, but back to the book, because you have a lot of writers and books. So it is true when you self-publish, you can't get the reviews that you can get when you have a publisher, right? Mm -hmm. In certain case, like Kirkus, I think you have to pay $500 or something, mm -hmm. but I wasn't willing to spend that money on it. So- this is interesting for libraries. There are journals and publications that the librarians who do the acquisitions read where they determine what they're going to collect, what they're mm -hmm. going to acquire. Right. So I wasn't in any of those. Our book was not in any of those. Mm -hmm. Guess what? When we were doing research, we're seeing it's in several libraries. So then we nice. went to all these libraries and it's because patrons asked for it. So yes. they added it to the collection. Anyway, obviously I can go on forever. Yeah. And so some things I just want to yeah. point out if people are listening, because you have a wealth of experience. And I think that's one of the reasons why this is so successful. Mildred, you are the amazing personality. Thank you. Well, you are the one who has all of this experience in terms of the PR and what to do. And number one, have your marketing materials together. Get a good sense of what your story is, who your readers are, and how you can reach them. Know what you want to say. Number two, begin to build that audience. In your case, for this book, it was your Instagram. But in the past, you had a newsletter. You've had all of these different things, these little videos you did, ways that you got in touch with people. Understand if you choose to self-publish what 
the pros are number one, you're in control. So you get to decide what you want to do and also understand the cons. Like sometimes it's hard to find books on Amazon. That can be a challenge sometimes, or they're not always on, I believe it's the Ingram spark list, which is what the libraries get, but you can overcome these things. No, actually our distributor is Ingram spark. Okay, your distributor yeah, is, no, Ingram is Ingram Spark. So Ingram Spark puts out a blast to all these places like Barnes and Noble online, yes. I think Target. We don't have control over the prices they're setting on Amazon. Right. But what I want to say is this is really important is to build a, ma a mailing list because yes. what I do is I do videos on Instagram. You know, Mildred's mindset's going to come up. Do you want to get the news? Click this link and sign mm -hmm. up. Okay. So the big thing is what if my Instagram goes down or they block me? Right. Now you want to get as many people as you could into your own newsletter, your mailing list, because yes. that you own. You don't, we Absolutely. don't own Instagram, right? Yes. It's a good launching pad. It's a good vehicle to build a following, but try to figure out ways, offer things so people are going to sign up and you get those mm -hmm. content. And I do want to add one other thing. So we, down here, I didn't, it's so funny. I didn't think to do it in, in New York. We did three events in New York and I don't know why I didn't think to do it because we did one in a bookstore that's like really trendy bookstore that opened up this year in Soho, but it's very old fashioned, but I did this at all my movie screenings and I haven't made a movie for years. I have a clickboard with a sign up. And if you mm -hmm. want to be on my mailing list that goes around the room, we just did an event nice. that really had very few people at the library. And I came with my clipboard and it was like 80% people signed up, mm -hmm. but I know there's other things that people do go on your iPhone, but my audience is an older audience. I came with my square ready for credit cards to take their orders, but they're like cash people. So yeah. That's another reason why you need to know your audience, because if you know the age of your audience, you know how tech savvy they are, or maybe if they have tech challenges that you can meet them where they are. And yes, I totally agree. Your newsletter is the most important thing. Your email list is truly the information that you own because any social media site can go down. Are Just out of curiosity, is your uh, newsletter on Substack or are you using a different program because that's something everyone's always yeah. talking about well, now you know what? I'm on both now mm -hmm. and it's funny because when I started self-publishing some stories I was mm -hmm. using him and I guess Substack's the venue for writing but my newsletter I have because I do so many things and so I've got my coaching so when you go to my website and you hit subscribe you pick which newsletters you want mm -hmm. and if I'm marketing my mother's book the link I put out is the subscription right to her, everything, mm -hmm. that, right? If I'm doing a forgiveness course and then, you know, they sign up, they get a free mm -hmm. download to my steps to forgiveness. I give them that link. Or if they just want the general, they go mm -hmm. and curate it. Yeah. So we could be here Forever. all day talking about that <laughs> because there's so much to talk about. I mean, you guys have so much information. Mildred, if someone is thinking, I really want to be an author. I want to write a book and they're thinking it's too late. So a lot of people that I work with are in their sixties, in their seventies, some in their eighties and even nineties. And they worry time is passing me by. I don't know if I can do it. What advice do you have for them? It's never too late and make sure when you write your book, you're writing facts because you'll get caught, caught with that. She would be a great fiction writer. <laughs> yes. If you are writing nonfiction, do not make things up. And right. no, it is never too late. And you are absolutely proof of that. You guys have a book tour that you're doing right. down in Florida. You had a book tour up in New York City. And if anyone wants to see the videos of Mildred on the go, touring around town with Gail, you can go to the their Instagram how are you taking care of yourselves and really bolstering your resilience as you do this book launch and book tour? Because that takes a lot of energy. Listen to your body. Mm -hmm. No one knows your body better than you do. If you're tired, 
Why down for five or ten minutes? You know, I told this to someone who interviewed me, and I don't I don't remember who it was. And she said, you know what? When we get through, I'm gonna close the door and I'm gonna close my eyes for five minutes. Listen to your body. Yes. And that will give you everything you need. That's all I have to say. I love that. Yeah. For me, my routine is I like to journal in the morning Mm -hmm. and then I do some of my exercises here. And then I get up insanely early between four and five 30. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And then I head over when I'm down here, I head over to the gym and I'm, I'm done in a really short period of time. And then I eat healthy. So I'm completely (laughs) gluten-free. I I eat healthy. And yeah, I don't need too much junk food. Yeah. So I take care of my body and hopefully my mind. The other thing is I'd like to know who goes to a doctor (laughs) and doesn't come out with an Rx. My cholesterol was a little high and he was giving me a a statin drug. I said, don't Mm -hmm. bother. What's my alternative? Right. And I brought it down. Then he calls me, my potassium is off. I took his advice. I drank water. I don't take this heartburn pill anymore. It would have been a side effect of another med. Mm-hmm. A heartburn pill. Or, right. Not a prescription. And he calls me, he says, oh, your potassium is down. I'm not a fool. I'm not telling you to stay away from meds. Come on. Some meds are necessary. Mm-hmm. But don't load yourself up with meds because many times one counteracts another. That's very true. Side effects. Yeah. She's been, in fact, she said that her female doctor, because she had a little thing done, said her insides look better than my 40-year-olds. And she attributes it to not putting pharmaceuticals in her body. I don't take anything, you know, and uh, at my age, you, you meet people and I am single. And when you go on a date, it's hysterical because you hear about every disease, every illness, every mm-hmm. pill, every whatever. So unfortunately, my siblings were not like that. My father was not like that. Mm-hmm. So yeah, they just told me my cholesterol was high and I don't know why you were encouraging me to take a statin when you preach not to. (laughs) (laughs) Anyway, I did not. I didn't even know until I heard this, that avocados are really good for lowering your Mm -hmm. cholesterol. So I just read. Yeah. So I'm doing it on diet. I'm very, again, you know, if you get sick and you need an infection, you need an antibiotic. We're not, I'm not anti that. She's not anti that. People kind of dependent. I develop when I don't know if you know this, when I was working on look at us now, mother, mm-hmm. I found my childhood diaries, which I hadn't read since I was a child. And I reread them because as a child, I was writing and drawing in them. Mm-hmm. I didn't make the connection, but my skin was getting very dry. And mm-hmm. the point that it was my hands, the skin was breaking. It was filled with plaque and split and bleeding. It was actually excruciating. I don't know if you want to see. Do you want to see? You can share that. Okay. If you don't mind, it's, it was pretty brutal. And this was four years and okay, here we go. I think I could, can you see this? Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yikes. That looks so painful. Yeah, it was. So that was four years. I live in New York, went to dermatologist, head of dermatology, Mm -hmm. first eczema, then psoriasis, went to Chinatown, did Chinese herbs nothing helped. And I was known for my hands. I had gloves. I had to wear vinyl gloves. In Mm. fact, COVID kicked in and no one could get masks or gloves. I had leftover gloves from four years of Mm -hmm. living. And because of my hands, when I'd answer the phone and everybody knew, oh, Gail, how are you? Oh, I'm in India. Everybody was shipping and sending me the magic lotion and cream. Mm -hmm. Nothing helped. Four years into this, I ended up writing to my chiropractor acupuncturist of years ago in LA, Dr. Wells, healer. I sent him an email, my pictures. He says, you need love. I said, I know, but I'm alone now. Then he writes, this is all emails, three emails. He writes Mm -hmm. back saying, what about your dog? I write back, she died. Mm -hmm. His last email was all I needed. He says, you have to trick yourself. That's when I knew Mm -hmm. this was emotional. 
That's mm-hmm. when I knew it was from reliving my childhood and my trauma. It came out through my hands, which is very interesting in my skin. Because one of the things she did, because my mom is a fashionista, is she dressed me so I looked gorgeous in organdy and fabrics that I had welts everywhere. Mm-hmm. So my skin is where every sort of emotional thing comes mm-hmm. out. And, and hands is symbolic because you're holding on to things. Yeah. So my skin and my hands releasing. And I had three sessions. I was on a budget with a Skype in those days mm-hmm. with a, a energy healer who introduced me to tapping emotional mm-hmm. technique, did three things every day, tapping, listen to Shigon tapes, this master Shunli ended up in my inbox mm-hmm. dating in less than a month. My skin was back. That is amazing. And I think both of the things that you're saying, you know, both you Mildred and you Gail is that trust yourself, trust your body. Your body is as miraculous. It can heal itself in all kinds of ways that we don't even imagine. And like you, I've been working to lower my cholesterol. So I think that's, and I have, I've, I've lowered it. I think 40 points just well, with, just with diet. So yes, I think there are amazing things that we can do. You know, when I go to a doctor, a new one, mm-hmm. and they say, please give me a list of your medication. I said, I'm low to pain, five milligrams and a baby aspirin. Mrs. Kirshen, ma'am, I guess you don't understand me. I need a list of all your medications. I tell her the same thing. She asked me the same question. I says, let's get something straight. Do you speak English? I said, so do I. That's what I take. (laughs) I have a grandmother who's 93. She is determined to live to 100 as well. And she is like you, Mildred. I think she takes a a fish oil pill, a vitamin D pill, and I think something to help her sleep and that's it. So she doesn't take any medications either. And I think that is part of longevity is really limiting those pharmaceuticals and treating your body as healthily as you can and listening to it. I'm not a pharmaceutical. Pharmaceuticals are necessary at times. Come on, if you have cancer or something, no, I don't want anyone to get the wrong idea. I'm glad you clarified because I agree and I'm not against them either. I think we all agree that when you are offered these, it's important to say, to think about, is this something that is necessary? Like, do you always need it? And of course, there are plenty of times when you do, but sometimes you don't. Like in the case of some people for statins, though not all people, my husband, he has to take a statin because he can't lower his cholesterol. Mm. Well, if people want to buy your book, because even though I know you're on a book launch, right, or a book tour right now, and this is going to air after that, it's going to be airing before Christmas. And this is a wonderful book for the holidays. It's a great gift book, you know, for anyone who just needs a little extra wisdom, or they really want to see proof that you can do anything at any age. What are the best ways for people to buy your book and to connect with you? I would say go to the website. Well, first of all, they want to follow us, go to Instagram. And I do put things on TikTok, but really Instagram is the main one. Mm-hmm. But I would say the website, which is gailkirschenbaum.com forward slash books, because when you go to the website, you can read it all about mom. Mm-hmm. And then you have all the codes and links to all the places you can buy the book. Of course, it's on Amazon. But if you buy directly from Ingram, where I have the link, you mm-hmm. get a better deal. It's on Barnes & Noble. It's online. It's it's mm-hmm. uh, online. And as I said, it's in every format. And, and by the way, we do have events a little bit into next year here nice. in, in Florida. <laughs> so be sure to take a look at their website so you can keep up to date on what's happening and all of the information around your Instagram page, your website, and how people can buy the book, as well as a couple of links to the movies that you have created will be in the show notes. So people can definitely check those out and buy their copy of Mildred's Mindset and be on the lookout for your memoir, Gail, because I know that is going to be coming up soon. Well, it has been an absolute joy and delight to have the two of you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having us. Thank you, Lisa. And I love your podcast. I listen to it all the time. Have a wonderful day. 
Bye now. Bye. <laughs> That's it for today's episode. If you'd like to learn more about Gail and Mildred or buy a copy of Mildred's Mindset, please see the show notes for this episode. If you're learning from or enjoying this podcast, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. It's a free and easy way to support the podcast. You can also get the latest episodes delivered to your inbox by signing up for my Writing Your Resilience newsletter. As a thank you, you'll receive a free copy of A Trauma Survivor's Guide to Writing the Tough Stuff. You can also follow the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, where you can leave a five-star review. If you have questions for me, comments about the podcast, or questions or topics you'd like me to consider for the Writing Your Resilience podcast, please leave a comment on YouTube. I read them all, and I'd love to hear from you.